first event of the, of the semester. Um, today we have with us Professor Roger Ward from Georgetown College in Kentucky. And he uh, was looking over his accomplishments today before the meeting. He uh, finished his PhD in philosophy in 1996 at Penn State. And I was, we almost uh, crossed paths because I was just arriving uh, to that grad program. So anyway, we have that in common. Um, and since uh, 1996, he's been a faculty member at Georgetown College. He has numerous publications on figures in the American philosophical tradition, including Jonathan Edwards, C.S. Peirce, uh, William James, Falcon come in. <laughs> William James, John Dewey. Uh, and today, his, uh, the talk is going to be on Peirce and Jane Addams. Um, but I did want to also point out that uh, Professor Ward is the editor of The Pluralist, which is an important uh, academic journal in philosophy. He's been editor since 2011. So um, I believe the title of the talk today is right in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> the work of community in C.S. Peirce and Jane Addams. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ward. I'll sit over here to stay out of the way so you can kind of read. Um, I put a lot of the the, the block quotes on the on the slideshow so you'll be able to follow along. Um, thanks. <clears throat> the standard story of community in American thinking often begins with English Puritan John Winthrop, who accepted the responsibility of leading a group to prepare for a settlement in New England for religious and economic reasons in 1630. Winthrop framed the purpose of the expedition on the lofty terms of establishing a city on a hill. That would be a visible sign of a community ordered by God. All the world is watching, he told his congregation huddled on the boat. Jill Lepore notes that the Puritan experiment was part of the larger English foray into the New World intended as a moral response to, to the barbaric mistreatment of indigenous people at the hands of the Spanish and Portuguese. Winthrop's purpose was to fulfill the call of God to construct what Jonathan Edwards later calls one holy and happy society. Of course, we know this effort eventually warranted a horrific economic dependence on slavery and the genocide of indigenous people. And yet the effort persists to construct a unified and morally sound community in the pluralistic constitutional democracy we inhabit. <clears throat> Consequently, we now take up our own responsibility for correcting and preserving this community life. Understanding the community demand, understanding the continuing demand for community Places that community places on us, as well as the work or effect of the community itself, are essential tasks for us today. That is the standard story, at least. <clears throat> but when we examine the impulse to attend to the community after the shaken experience of COVID-19, vaccine resistors, January 6th insurrectionists, the growing wave of white Christian nationalism, and the general loss of confidence in the grand narrative of America, we realize a different kind of demand for the meaning of community. Is the question of the community more than just a version of concern for the prospects of our individual lives and the ultimate value of our own thought? If it is, then tracing the reality of community means decentering the individual, decentering the individual knowing subject is the primary mode of truth finding. Individuals are functions of a community, but the work accomplished is more than what we individually want to do with it. Aviva Zornberg draws this insight from the life of Moses, and this idea connected to Peirce and Adams prompted this essay. I'll say more about Zornberg and Moses a little bit later. The project of the community, what it accomplishes with and through us, shifts the concept of an ideal from a presumed starting point to a good resulting from a process which no individual or definable set of individuals has control over. But we know from experience that things never proceed smoothly. So a second aspect of the work of community is picking out resistances along the way, focusing our attention on nodes of conflict. These points of conflict may include philosophical or religious absolutes, but also versions of naturalism that delimit the possibility of meaning if they are disconnected from a robust notion of community. 
A third aspect <clears throat> is that the work of the community propels the development of self-controlled individual action. Individuals become aware of a demand or perhaps an obligation to realize their calling to meaningful work and experience. Taken together, these aspects give shape to what I call an orientation to community. This orientation is like a disposition arising with individuals that leads them to actively engage in service or even self-sacrifice for the benefit of the community. This can occur in shared action in one, lo one location and also by individuals dispersed in time and place. Such an orientation is essential for the free expression of trust in the work of the community. Even so, faith in the progress of community is often challenged by the immediacy of politics and the opacity of philosophical descriptions. Sometimes the only thing to do is to get to work and figure out the explanation afterwards. This is the story of community that emerges in C.S. Burst and Jane Adams. They both share the ground of the community in their philosophical work, and we will see that their thought diverges like two branches of a tree. Okay, so someone liked it. Here we go. <laughs> um, but their concept of community links them and us to a reality of human life that reaches back into our remote history and stretches outward, seeking growth into a fuller expression. Whatever challenges to individual choices may arise, and however the stability of civil life may be threatened by external violence or internal, internal dissolution, the work of the community holds human life to this prospect of continuity of human purpose and good. The living character of community can be discovered, nurtured, and tested. And the nature of this good provides a context for individual lives and speculative hope. It is an object of philosophical inquiry. The philosophical use of community first appears in Peirce's 1868 essay, Some Consequences of Four Incapacities. He argues that logic is the voice of community that holds all thought together and brings individuals to expression. Jane Addams arrived at a resolution of her desire to work for the community as an expression of her of a humanity-centered Christianity in 1888. The next year, she established the Whole House Settlement <clears throat> and began her lifelong work of social development an anti-war organization that was recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1934. Examining the different but complementary approaches to community by Adams and Peirce will provide, I hope, a fuller image of the work of community. My larger argument, I think there's a slide coming. I don't my camera, go ahead. Yeah, there we go, yes, good. <clears throat> uh, uh, funds in the, so I'm sorry. My larger argument is that the unique differ differences in the ways Person Adams conceptualized the work of the community funds an enlivening tension within American philosophy and provides direction for correcting or saving American philosophy from fragmentation and loss of meaning for our current needs. I think our present circumstances in America are calling for experimentation and combining the strength of American philosophical approaches to community with religious traditions such as Christianity to produce a more powerful warrant for upholding both the dignity of humanity and seeking the highest order of self-controlled development. The religious, develop, the religious dimension speaks to our need for a hope grounded in the nature of what is real. The philosophical dimension speaks to the demand for consistency in our thinking and action and using reason to resolve or remove blocks on the road of progress to a good and beautiful human social world. <clears throat> purse, logic as the basis of community. Who all has read some purse? A couple of you, okay, okay. At first blush, Charles Sanders purse may not seem like the best person to argue for the significance of community. He was intensely philosophical and scientific, somewhat irascible in person, and he spent the last 25 years of his life in relative seclusion in Milford, Pennsylvania. However, Peirce's interest in scientific log logic ruled his lifelong philosophical work. And he, more than any other single person, I think, worked out the relation of logical inferences to the broader sense of inquiry we see in science, where individuals contribute the work of their reasoning to a larger project of inquiry into truth. Logic leads first to community. 
Hearst was appointed to give a lecture course on logic in 1865 by the president of Harvard. It was quite an honor recognizing the precocious intellect of this 26 year old. From a survey of classic texts, Peirce comes to an early claim that logic is unpsychological. <clears throat> that is, logic is not just the way you or I happen to think. He devotes the first two of 11 lectures to this topic. One philosophical opponent is John Stuart Mill, who claims logic is just the law of nature. But if this is so, we could never know it. There would be no way to verify or tell if it was otherwise. Hearst determines that a system of symbolization describes the realm of logic, the internal operation between an object, the symbol of the object, and the interpretation of the symbol is the fundamental relation of logic, what he calls a trinity of terms, and he will use that the rest of his philosophical life. The second advantage of the unpsychological view, he says, is that it affords the most convenient means of exploding the false notions of the subject. What he means in part is that the individual is not the primary subject of inquiry. Listen to how he frames this. <clears throat> we find that every judgment is subject to a condition of consistency. Its elements must be capable of being brought to a unity. This consistent unity, since it belongs to all judgments, may be said to belong to us. Or rather, since it belongs to the judgments of all mankind, we may be said to belong to it. This move decenters the logical subject from the individual to the community. First, judgments of our own reasoning have meaning or significance only because of a system of symbolization that we inhabit. Second, the judgments of all mankind are measured by consistency of being brought to unity. Again, not that you or I produce that unity, but that we belong to it. He concludes the lecture with a summary claim. I define logic, therefore, as the science of the conditions which enable symbols in general to refer to objects. As a science, it has discoverable laws that can be determined, tested, and validated. Hirsch was actively seeking ways to submit his ideas for examination by other philosophers when he corresponded with W.T. Harris, editor of the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, the first of its kind in America. Harris asked Peirce to send an essay on the objective validity of the laws of logic. Peirce sent three. In the story of American pragmatism, these three essays are monumentally important, particularly the second, some questions, I'm sorry, some consequences of four incapacities. Let me explain the odd title. The first essay challenges the claims of modern philosophy in the style of Descartes that claims individuals have capacities of introspection and intuition. Hearst dismantles these, showing that we build even our conception of our own identity and the idea of ourself on ideas drawn from others, and that we cannot even determine if any idea we have connects directly to an object outside of consciousness. A consequence of these conclusions in the second essay is that we have to seek a new platform for philosophy built on the notion that all thought is in signs. In this section of the essay, Peirce arrives at the formulation. Thus, the very origin of the conception of reality shows that this conception essentially involves the notion of a community, and that's the original typeface there, without definite limits and capable of an indefinite increase in knowledge. And so those two series of cognitions, the real and the unreal, consist of those which at a time sufficiently future, the community will always continue to reaffirm, and of those which under the same conditions will ever after be denied. The essential point is that the conception of reality entails a community as the principal subject of inquiry. Laws of logic arise within communal inquiry and their validity hangs on the social impulse. That logicality rigidly requires, before all else, that no determinate fact, nothing which can happen to a man's self, should be of more consequence to him than every, everything else. He who would not sacrifice his own soul to save the whole world is illogical in all his inferences collectively. So the social principle is rooted intrinsically in logic. With this 
charged language of self-sacrifice hammers the idea that there is no single fact that you or I or any individual can, can hang on to as the key to the nature of reality or truth. If I die right here, right now, that fact would not touch on the meaning of reality. Therefore, our lives are meaningful only if we would sacrifice our individual claims to the truth developing within the community. Logic hangs on sociality, first says, and adds that the infinite hope which we all have is that what is best will come about. But this is not what any one person can expect to know. We can only submit to the logic of inquiry in the community. First concludes, if its object were any determinable, determinate fact, any private interest, it might conflict with the results of knowledge and so with itself. But when its object is of a nature as wide as the community can turn out to be, it is always a hypothesis uncontradicted by facts and justified by its indispensableness for making any action rational. Tracing out the meaning of community of inquiry for Peirce requires touching on his 1878 essays on the logic of science where he develops a pragmatic maxim. I don't think I've got a slide for this one. I don't think. No, it's the next one. Uh, so hang on a second. Let me, sure. let me just go read through this. Um, requires touching on his 1878 es essays on the logic of science where he develops a pragmatic maxim. William James takes this up as the center of his presentation in 1898 that introduces the term pragmatism, a definition that comes to the notice of Jane Addams. We'll talk about her in a moment. In the six essays of this series, Peirce also lays the ground for the community of scientific inquirers, inquirers as a body of individuals submitting their work to critical examination by others for the purpose of removing error by continual testing and refinement. A critical aspect of making our ideas clear. Who's read that essay, how to make our ideas clear? Okay. Is the impulse to participate in and commit one's work to the furtherance of the community. The community moves toward the real only by individuals who adopt the normative guides of logic, ethics, and aesthetics. Beauty draws the community forward in inquiry to the conclusions that can be adopted and forever after be affirmed. This includes Peirce's renewed interest in God as a personal creator following a religious experience he had in 1892. After this time, he returned to the church and his philosophical writing shows an increasing interest in the relation of God and community. As the community pursues truth, it discovers its own reality and the orienting idea of God in the process. Peirce describes the reality of God as infinitely progressing and indeterminate in its final meaning, but providing determination of facts that are true in its pursuit, a life he describes as evolutionary love in 1895. Peirce says, this is the result of the discovery. Growth comes only from love, from, I will not say self-sacrifice, but from the ardent impulse to fulfill another's highest impulse. The philosophy we draw from John's gospel is that this is the way mind develops. And as for the cosmos, only so, so far as it is yet mind and so has life, is it capable of further evolution. Love, recognizing germs of loveliness in the hateful, gradually warms it into life and makes it lovely. The work of the community thus provides the orienting object of inquiry for individuals, as well as comprising the system of logical inference by which all thought operates to connect us in an evolving relationship with truth. Next, Jane Addams and Evolving Community. Jane Addams created the Whole House Settlement in 1889. Who's read any Jane Addams? One, okay, good. Um, 1889, 29 years of age, <clears throat> uh, with a conviction that investing her life in a mixed immigrant community of Italians, Russian, Greeks, and Jews was the best way to express her moral and religious energy. Her unique approach has its roots in her self-questioning that began during her college years and extended through the critical period of 1881 to 1889. During this time, she suffered from physical and emotional ailments, considered and then dropped the idea of medical school, traveled twice to Europe with groups of friends, wouldn't that be sweet, 
<laughs> she found part of her answer at Toynbee Hall in East London, a settlement house organized by Oxford scholars who, put, who were putting their Christian socialism to work amidst horrific poverty. She found part of her answer reading Tolstoy, who asserted that action was necessary to clear up a moral malaise. She admired Tolstoy's radical Christian commitment to pacifism and working in self-sufficient equalitarian communities with the peasants. Her letters with close friend Ellen Gates Starr provide a record of the synthesis she was seeking between moral action and religious convictions. On her return from the second Europe trip and after much internal struggle on the question of Christianity, she was baptized into a rural Presbyterian church in Cedarville, Illinois. This was October, 1888, just a few months before she opened Hull House in Chicago. <clears throat> James Hunt interprets this baptism as her desire to link the ideals of Jesus with the ideals of democracy and a vision derived from her reading of Tolstoy and her encounter with social settlements and Christian socialism in London. Adams reflects on her decision with these words. Who was I with my dreams of universal fellowship that I did not identify myself with the institutional statement of this belief? Although she frequently partnered with churches and pastors and often spoke in churches, Whole House did not provide religious instruction. She wanted it to be open to all and to present no barriers to anyone's participation. Its primary work was developing the social life of the community, a focus she articulates in relation to the early Christians in Rome. In an 1892 essay, A New Impulse from an Old Gospel, she said this nascent community did not have a religion, but a practice of sacrificing themselves for the weak, children, and aged, and identifying with the common lot. The impulse was, quote, finding Christ which lieth in each fellow, but which no man can unfold, save in fellowship. A happiness ranging from the heroic to the pastoral enveloped them. They were to possess a revelation as long as life had new meaning to unfold, new action to propose. From this foundational concept of a community life unfolding new meaning by actively attending to those people most in need, Adams and her colleagues at Hull House developed the tools of urban sociology, compiling and using data on tenement conditions, the existence of sweatshops, the relation of tenement crowding and unsanitary conditions. Jean Betka Elstein remarks that nearly every piece of major reform in the years 1895 to 1930 comes with Jane Adams' name attached in one way or another, labor, housing, eight hour workday, old age and unemployment insurance, public schools, playgrounds, juvenile and domestic court systems. Adams put herself at the service of the community and followed its meaning as it unfolded in new paths of action. In order to focus my, on my particular interest on the work of the community, I turn now to two early essays of Adams from 1892, The Subjective Necessity for Social Settlements and The Objective Value of a Social Settlement. In the first essay, Adams notes three aspects of the subjective impulse to settlement work as coming from an interest in one, socializing democracy, sharing the race life, and promoting a re renaissance of a particular form of Christianity. The first of these entails expanding the meaning of democracy from a narrow concern for voting to include talking and working with people with shared interests or concerns. A neighborhood association that draws all re residents together is an example. The race life impulse is fascinating because Adams describes her conviction of a communal life inhabiting individuals that seeks expression in present forms of action and experience. Race in this context means the content of human life reflecting and acting toward itself. What we each add to the world of experience when we act for and on behalf of past present or future humans like us. In fact, the danger behind this impulse is absence of participation. Our race life drives us toward concern and acting on behalf of others. Good. Our organism holds memories and glimpses of that long life of our ancestors, she continues, 
Nothing so deadens the sympathies and shrivels the power of enjoyment as the persistent keeping away from the great opportunities for helpfulness. We have all had longings for a fuller life, which should include the use of these faculties. The subjective necessity is for a person with faculties and interests to find a positive outlet for her energy and also for the enjoyment that comes with participating practically in the life of the organism of the race life. To find that outlet blocked is positively damaging and stultifying for the individual. The life of the community makes a demand on the individual that social rules or conventions sometimes interrupts or resists. The third impulse elevates the first two by historical reference to the principle that brought Christianity into social existence. The drive for this wider and unlimited human connection seen in the quote, democracy, true democracy of the early church. This social practice was in fact a source of revelation of truth. Christians believed of what Jesus said that this revelation to be held and made manifest must be put into terms of action. That action is the only medium man has for receiving and appropriating truth. The emphasis is not on the deliverance of divine truth from a remote heavenly bank, but rather the immersion in the social life of caring for the weak is the only means of accessing truth in human experience. Revelation is possible only if we act toward the least of these. Let me emphasize that for Adams, these impulses are present and potential already within our lives, especially the lives of young educated people. They are trained into the significance of applying their power to serving the community, feeding the impulse to serve the social reality of the community organism. If practices of culture inhibit their exercise of this, this impulse, not only is truth lost, but trained and nurtured individuals are cut off from the source of deep satisfaction and social benefit. The effort to attain democratic brotherhood requires attending to motivating ideals, Adam says, because it is impossible to establish a higher political life than the people themselves crave. That is, it is difficult to see how the notion of a higher civic life can be fostered, save through common intercourse, that the blessings we associate with a life of refinement and cultivation can be made universal and must be made universal if they are to be permanent, that the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain is floating in midair until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. To bring this ideal of community into concrete reality, to anchor it in a functioning social life is the work of Hull House. The companion piece, the objective value of the social settlement <clears throat> provides nitty gritty details of the neighbors to Hull House, how each corner opened in the neighborhoods of different ethnic and religious origins, the number of children in the nursery, the number of saloons in the 19th ward, the schedule of meetings, different groups day by day. The residents, the residents were people who lived there. They brought their best ideas and expressions to the clients who came to the house. Room was provided for groups to recover the language and poetry of their home countries that was squeezed out of their lives by working and depressing living conditions. Adams reflects on what this work revealed in the moral and social lives of their neighbors. Working people live in the same streets with those in need of charity, but they themselves, so long as they have health and good wages, require and want none of it. As one of their numbers said, they require only what their that their aspirations be recognized and stimulated and the means of attaining them put at their disposal. The aspirations were already present and yearning for expression. Finding appropriate means to stimulate these discovered aspirations requires flexibility and experiment. There is no established or permanent means for evoking hope and connecting to the dreams we carry from our ancestors. Adam's work in Chicago had a remarkable impact on the development of American pragmatism through her interactions with John Dewey. Dewey moved to the University of Chicago in 1890, and he became interested in the social action of Hull House. He frequently lectured there and was on the board. The intellectual impact Adams had on Dewey and vice versa is contested, but it was clearly profound. 
After Dewey worked with Adams, he wrote to his wife that she had, quote, entirely converted him to the practical dimension of social amelioration, displacing his earlier idealism. In a biography of her father, Jane Mary Dewey, named for Jane Adams and her friend Mary Smith, counts Adams as the primary influence for moving Dewey from idealism to naturalism. Reflecting on the significance of Adams on Dewey's later work, his daughter, Dewey's daughter, writes, how we think and democracy and education were written after Dewey was at Columbia are direct fruits of his Chicago experience. His own work and his contacts with others led to a fusion in them of his educational and philosophical ideas. He expresses in Democracy and Education the opinion that philosophy itself is the general theory of education, taking education in a broad sense enough to include all the factors that serve to shape the disposition, emotional, intellectual, and active of the individuals who constitute society. The work of the community expressed in the life and work of Jane Addams is to allow its force to spread to all its constituent members, emerging in the reality of their social interactions as a shared con conception of life and as a means of addressing problems of experience. The goal is to concretize the truth of the community in human experience following the desire for a richer, <clears throat> fuller, more beautiful, and productive shared life that is already in process. This communal reality is so universal, it doesn't require a name. It is an end within life, not after it. The value it highlights is the power individuals have to make choices of life based on what they know, using available resources, expanding available choices so the community can reconstruct itself into forms furthering its wholesomeness and beauty. This is the work of community in Jane Adams that Jane Adams joins and extends she doesn't create the good, she cultivates the space for the good to grow. Now for a little expansion. Drawing from, yes, please. Drawing from the work of Person Adams, we can make a couple of preliminary conclusions about the work of the community. One, community is an end in itself, the goal of both our social human experience and the condition of logical thought. Community is more than a fortunate byproduct or an honorific term applied to human life. Community exhibits power in bringing individuals in positive relation with each other for the purpose of achieving goals of human thriving, idealization of experience, and pursuit of truth. In Persian terms, community is a real that finds a way to get itself thought. For Perse and Adams, community is created collectively, embodying a community is to submit to being moved by the spirit or realizing the spirit in one's actions. This embodying community becomes apparent in the interpretation of new discoveries of inquiry for Peirce and new needs of neighbors in Adams. Conclusion two, we have work to do as a consequence of the first conclusion. Our first responsibility is to observe the qualitative character of the community we inhabit. This includes the logical space of relation and inquiry, as well as the aesthetic texture of interpersonal experience. Any action related to community begins within the space of these experiences. Second, we must also attend to the, the occurrences of interruption or challenge arising within this observing experience. Recognizing our own errors of reasoning is the basic principle of resistance. When we act wrongly, when we regret our words or our actions, we discover the permanence of communal reality standing opposite. Likewise, the awareness of social harm or dissatisfaction at the, at the mistreatment of others signals an absence upon which we can focus inquiry and, and action. Third, the movement of inquiry and action illuminates the direction for ampliative inquiry, for moving ourselves and our social relations from what is to what can be. These conclusions are illustrated by Aviva Gottlieb Jornberg's linguistic and psychoanalytic account of, of the scriptural and Talmudic accounts of Moses. She illustrates the ambiguous role of identity for Moses. He was born into genocide, dislocated from his birth family, without a clear communal identity. Killing an Egyptian exposed his deeper separation from both societies, and he flees into the desert. 
Zornberg closely examines the verbal interplay of revelation and anger in the conversation Moses has with the voice on the burning bush. Moses' first question is, who am I? The interaction with the voice exposes the absence of Moses' own identity, expressed in his inability to speak, provoking the anger of Yahweh. Zornberg extends the moment of revelation from this divine encounter to the first encounter with Pharaoh. Moses demands release for the Hebrews. Pharaoh responds by imposing very harsh conditions on the Hebrews. The Hebrew people and leaders attack Moses for bringing a failed promise of thriving life to them. In the aftermath of this rejection, Moses expresses outrage at God. Why have you forsaken these people? God replies, now you will see what I will do. Revealing that Moses' outrage against the senseless suffering of the Hebrews was a trigger for divine action. The movement of the community toward a fuller version of its own life brings Moses' identity, brings Moses to identity in action. God also comes to a point of self-revealing identity in the conflict of the Hebrews and Pharaoh by providing a name, I am who I will be, Yahweh, to concretize this moving spirit in the world. The coincident revelation of the divine and human community in the context of solicited individual action corresponds to Jane Addams' notion of new revelations emerging only in action and Peirce's agapistic insurgence of new conceptions in response to existential doubt. The object of the community holds the individual and divine presence together into a triad of developing meaning. Let me briefly re recapitulate the considerations of community from the beginning of this essay. The work of the community entails some human impulse to it, even before a satisfying conception of community is possible or experienced. The impulse develops into a focus on resistance to the community's full development and extension. And addressing these re resistances calls for individuals into active and meaningful participation. Particular individuals must be called into the active service of the community punctuated by these moments of outrage at senseless suffering. This dialectic of impulse, resistance, and participation are the organic grounds of a moral and philosophical platform I've called an orientation to community. Only from such a place is it possible to develop a self-critical understanding of what it means to work for the community. A sufficiently coherent conceptual framework emerges that enables individuals to restructure their interactions around and in productive relation with the work of the community. This disposition of thought action and reflection is a product of concrete engagement in the life of the community, either addressing its conditions as Adams demonstrates or delving into the logic of its developing thought as Peirce demonstrates. But the question of why Adams or Peirce developed this orientation to community remains unexplained. What impelled young Jane Adams to visit Toynbee, Tolstoy, and the Gospels? And Peirce, whose abrasive personality cost him jobs and a marriage, still persuades the rector of the Episcopal Church in Milford, Pennsylvania, to, ad to admit him to the official role. In fact, he implores his good friend, William James, why don't you join the church? Peirce admits his beliefs do not fit easily with accepted Christian doctrine, and yet he tells Lady Welby that when he participates in worship, he says, I say the creed, but for other people. I cite these religious moments for Person Adams to show that we have a dearth of language to address the notion of an orientation to community in terms other than religious. The only human salvation we can really expect, a movement into safety or wholeness or consumatory experience is from the work of this kind of community. And it will be a salvation from our problems and two, a life of more meaning and deeper challenge. God saved Israel out of Egypt, but that salvation put them on a long and winding road of receiving salvation hope, always slip, slipping from their grasp, but still drawing them and us forward. As Ornberg says, salvation is that God's word holds true, that there is life in this pursuit that exceeds our own narrow goals and wishes. 
The work of Person Adams strikes me as interestingly paired in the sense of the work of the community in terms of human experience and its development and as a focus or goal of self-controlled individual action. I hope I've raised more questions than I've answered. <laughs> My goal has been to eliminate the work of community that takes up these two particular examples. What will follow, I hope, is tracing out the echoes or ripples of these thinkers in the expanding work of the community appearing in the American thinkers. Thank you. Okay, well, we do have time for question and answer. Um, you, I, I just wanted to yeah. question for that last little sentence. You're saying that you wanted to remove this idea of community, or I want to follow it. <clears throat> okay, you want yeah. to expand. Yeah, so okay. I'm going to take so American pragmatism kind of develops in this response to sort of the failures of both sort of the, the Christian idea of, of, of American community and the failures of modern philosophy. So pragmatism develops in those ways, okay. and I think the the emphasis on Pursuing the good of philosophy uh, gets replaced um, when I think it should be focused on the on pursuing the kind of community. So that the community is an orienting idea to the development of American philosophy. That's not always kind of. <coughs> Can I just comment? Yeah, please. Uh, so yeah. It, see, uh, um, it seemed, I don't want to be disrespectful in this, right? Yeah, come on, it seemed very religious. You know yeah, I mean? know. Right? It yeah, like community was a proxy for God. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like, as opposed to like community holding together truth, it actually is still just God. You know, together. yeah, this is a, uh, it's clearly a problem I've got to work out. Um, and one of the reasons that um, it, it appears like this is because when I started looking for how first grounds his notion of community, in the end, he goes right right back to neglected arguments for the reality of God. Okay. And when I looked at Jane Addams, when her her developing sense of community, and it was in her beginning in this very religious moment, and then she kind of leaves it. You know, it's very interesting. She starts that way, and then almost never mentions it afterwards. Um, but it's very central to the beginning of it. So yeah, and and the Moses thing, I was just reading that book, and it just really seemed to. Hey, my one, I was already <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I know that's I know for the audience. I have to I have to find a way to kind of renegotiate those terms so that it doesn't appear like what you thought that I'm just aligning community and God. Yeah. Yeah. It strikes me as um, almost exactly what you hear out of Bill Wilson in 1935 in the institution of AA with community as God replace this higher power. As oh, oh for Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So this, um, it's, it's it feels to me like the same kind of thinking that one only finds oneself and um, in losing oneself in the service of others. Right, and, right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't know how those things are. are you know, so <clears throat> um so I, I have heard, and I'm not sure if this is exactly true, but it's a 12-step program. Um, and I did my dissertation on Jonathan Edwards and the and the um, uh, religious affections. There are 12 signs of religious affection, and they've been they've been aligned. There are a lot of 12. Uh, a lot of 12s. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing, you know, the um, the focus in the AA thing is like is more on the individual side. Well, not really, because by the time you get to step 12, the only way that you you maintain yourself yeah, by, is by by bringing others and serving the community. Right, because that's right. the last thing that you have to do. Right. And all meaning is established in perpetuate. That's why you can't ever leave AA. Right. right? I mean, it's true, right? It's, if they do, that it's like you went out the door and everything yep. is going to be bad. And you're going to borrow your um, So it is, it is all. Um, yeah identity salvation yeah is yeah. in community and in extending the community and i'll track that down yeah, yeah. i think it's similar yeah. i mean i think yeah. I mean, he was reading william james right the bread is exactly oh, yeah, religious absolutely. experience so, right yeah, yeah right so so james is reading edwards and james also has an impact on the founding of a and, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, and james and james. <clears throat> james is going to be kind of a foil in my larger project because he takes purse's communal inquiry and reshapes it to much more of an individual 
inquiry. Mm -hmm. And there's a real fight between them. Every time Peirce publishes something, James publishes a different version of it. Um, even the, the pronouncement of pragmatism was based on, after, after Peirce gives his lectures in 1898 at, in, in, uh, in Harvard, um, uh, James then uses his 1878 ideas to start to articulate pragmatism for the first time in print. And it's clearly a mistaken version of what Peirce was doing. And they fight like this the entire way, but they remain great friends. So it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, so I have just uh, one question of clarification and then one, one other point. The quote that you had from, from Peirce in the beginning, that logic is the voice of the community. Yeah. It's an incredible quote. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't sure if I was uh, understood one of your slides correctly. Yep. It sounded as if you said that Peirce was anti-psychologistic. Unpsychological. In this sense, term, is unpsychological. Logic is unpsychological. So, in the sense that it's not reducible to the way that the patterns of human thinking. <clears throat> right. The laws of thought are not principles that you or I supply. Mm -hmm. That there are laws of thought that are objective <clears throat> that we find by discovery, inquiry, and argument. It's a very fascinating point. I, I, yeah. I thought of the, the, the conflict between Frege and Husserl as a similar point. I wasn't sure if I, if I heard yeah. that correctly. Yeah. But, but the second point, I, I wonder if you could say something about maybe what Adams thinks or what you think is the <laughs> distinction between the people and the community. Um, <clears throat> she had, there's a yeah, quote yeah, that yeah. the people are craving this kind of way of life, right, but the people, right. I think of some of the rhetorical ways that people use that term, yep, uh, yep. That, that, that the term the people is used, yep. That's and a it seems very like good question. Is uh, hang on, I'm going to write that question down in the middle. I'm stalling. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to rephrase it. No, no, that's right. <laughs> 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 Another moment. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, and some people, anybody here know Adams better than I do? Maybe a little more. Um, <clears throat> no. Yeah. <laughs> I think people are in Kuwait community. I think they can be brought to realizing their ideals and join and share activity toward their self-defined good and in that process become community. But I don't think there's anything necessarily limiting people from community except organization and some kind of some kind of act and acting. That would, would be my guess. In COVID. Yeah. Like it. Yeah. Un, unformed un, or possible community. What do you think? I have lots more questions, but yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, Eric, I don't put, sorry about follow up. Yeah. I was thinking something similar. Um, it sounded like community never is on this conception. Yeah, I think you're community right. Community is in this, I don't necessarily like it's not the community is sort of always becoming, or yeah. Yeah. whatever is always becoming yeah. community. Yeah. Um, but in that case, I, I sort of lose the explanatory power of community <clears> itself. <throat> Right here, right. except as like final end or something. Um, so, can you help yeah. me understand the? Yeah. So, so for Adams, community in that sense becomes vital when it begins to identify threats to it. So it may not have. There's not a final form, and it's not pointing to anything that will only be realized like in some ideal state after death or at the end of time. So, community it does exist now. But in the process of identifying those threats to it and the possibilities of its expansion. So it's sort of an already not yet kind of thing. So I don't think you can ever say that you've achieved community in a final form. But and uh, there's a there's a sentence I have in here that it it does help identify discrete kinds of issues or possibilities. So it does help discriminate. From a current, you know, set of possibilities, things we can do that would work for or with the community. Um, that's a good. That's I don't, it's a hard thing for me to put words around. Yeah. Do you think that this kind of uh, creates a tension in because of course community 
identifies threats to itself and reacts to them. Yes. Does that mean that, I mean, braided community is uh, conceived uh, around the ideals of uh, uh, democratic enlightenment that is always forward and, mm -hmm. you know, it wants equality and whatever, but if yeah. my community is more provincial, so yeah. sort of more, yeah. Yeah. You know, more, more uh, in its own ways, and given that the, the, the models of community that we've been working with yeah. are, are also kind of coming from a particular tradition, <laughs> Absolutely. Like tradition yeah. that has certain conceptions that are more orthodox yeah. and perhaps yeah. self-closed rather than open. Yeah, the way and the, so I think democracy wants to be. I think so it's, what, how do we negotiate that kind of uh, This tension? is where it gets really dicey. Yeah. Uh, because I think the, the very principle that makes community active and, and good does also reflect the possibility of um, misaligned priorities and activities. So uh, Royce in his in his work on community had asked the same question of, you know, what are a group of robbers, a community, right? And so he's got to he's got to deal with the very same kind of issue. And he talks about loyalty to some absolute good. That's sort of what defines a community of loyalty as opposed to a community of robbers. Um, but even Royce, I think, um, kind of falls along the line of what you said, provincial. I mean, his his ideals of community, as democratically oriented as they are, um, reject the needs or the the uh, aspirations of the uh, I forget what island he was he was talking about a, a someone an island in the Caribbean, um, and it was clearly sort of a, a racial separation. So he's got this Teutonic notion of, of, a, of a community that rejected, you know, the uh, Afro-Caribbean kind of people as like real participants. And so even Royce has his problem. Yeah. As a follow-up to that, um, uh, speaking of community yeah. of robbers, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the Puritans. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with yeah. whom you started. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was thinking about um, you right because you set it up as like the Puritans were going to be not barbaric like the Spanish and the French. Yep. And <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So okay, this is where I'm with this. because I have a question about um, I think about threats to the community and also about the second point you said about um, picking out resistances and nodes of conflict. And I, so I was thinking about genocide and slavery as the conditions of possibility for the Puritans. Yep. And, and we could say for the inheritors yep. of any community, yep. kind of regardless of like it's yeah. where it's coming from in Europe. Um, and so then I wonder about if community is like an inchoate but vitalized through its threats and some of the, con mm. the conflicts and modes of resistance that it's going to meet are, for instance, in the United States, people being like land back, right? or this is stolen land, right? right and nobody's right. illegal on stolen land. These right. kinds of right. things that have become. Well, in, in California, they gave that the state returned a beach to a beach property to some black owners that had been kicked off like 80 years ago. Yeah. 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 I don't know, but if yeah, we yeah. if we take it seriously that all of all of settler colonial land, yeah. right, yeah. is stolen, yeah. then it seems like the resistance we see. I don't know, like at Standing Rock, right? Yeah, yeah. Could be a threat to the community. Mm -hmm. That on this account, I'm not sure what normative yeah. claims against that, right? That it seems like then you have license on this account of the right. community to protect against those threats. But but then we're talking about a community of robbers, right? Then it's not so exactly. Yeah. No. So the uh, and this this is what raises all the problems, right? <laughs> because <laughs> okay. when you start thinking about community, then you start really thinking about what what would be like an evolving community. I mean, if we began now with all of us in this room and you were talking about the indigenous dance mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we started now and wanted to do the right thing as a community for the people we have displaced over the last several hundred years, could we figure out some things to do? Well, we could do the things they ask us to do. We could do the thing, yeah, right. right. Which would be land back. Exactly, which is right. the dissolution of the community. Well, yeah. or, or 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 a different model of of sharing, but with their mm -hmm. with their agreement and participation, and I mean, we only see it as you know that 
they only have one conception of ownership or we don't have ownership. But, you know, even like, a, oh, what's the uh, Quaker guy, John Woolman, right? So <clears throat> early colonial Quaker, uh, when they were still trading with lands from the, from the indigenous people, they were only cultivating land that they had, had traded for. So they weren't yet just stealing it. They were making some, some well, trades. But, uh, property regime, the regime of property or ownership, right. right, is an importation of colonialism. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And so yeah, trading yeah. for yeah. land or deeding land right. is itself an imposition of absolutely. a philosophical system. Yeah. yeah. No, and I then not, because, to get because threats like, to it, like absolutely. Yeah. Like right. But but what Woolman was arguing was um that it be that they should confine themselves to the land that the that the the ancient possessors was his title mm -hmm. for the indigenous people that they had provided them the ancient possessors had provided them some room mm. and they should confine themselves to that room mm. right mm. it was an interesting that idea that doesn't sound bad no, 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 no. that's uh, better than what happened yeah, yeah exactly he was yeah. the by the way a woman was the first quaker to argue systematically against slavery mm. in the quaker community that were also trade traders mm -hmm. and slave mm -hmm. slave tra traders mm -hmm. so he was arguing this against his own community mm -hmm. for their re relationship to the to the africans yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so the question is you know is there some way forward as a community that includes the people that we've you know that other people have taken land from mm -hmm. um i mean i hope there's a way forward mm -hmm. i mean one way is to say we're just you know we, like friends of mine who are against the uh, what is it when you're you're repaying property reparations reparations so the whole idea of reparations is just like anathema if we start that we have to give them everything it's like well that's actually, <laughs> yeah, you know right. that's a pretty good point isn't it yeah, yeah. um but there is a kind of interesting part because you started with this kind of tension between the individual and the community yeah and there's yeah. a kind of like you need to dissolve the individual or the community or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm yeah. not paraphrasing, yeah. maybe not yeah. properly, but because the community is the locus of truth, meaning, and these things, and it's how the individual actually access the truth. Right. Right. But the dangers we've been trying to kind of you know, beat around yeah. are that yeah. community can also be the locus of blindness Absolutely. Right, to its yeah. own yeah. Yeah. errors. Yeah. And, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. most communities, concrete communities, say, yeah. right, that right. we yeah. live in today, yeah. were actually yeah. built on exploitation, slave yes, trade, yeah. right? all yeah. sorts of things yeah. Yeah. stretching on the way back to the beginnings of humanity, yeah. right? And there's continuing to yeah. do that today, right? Yeah. So yeah. many communities are doing, you know, land grabbing. Like I, I think of my, I'm a, I'm a kind of member of a, uh, another community because I was born in Israel. So I'm kind of also Israeli a little bit. And they're, that's what they're doing. Right? So they're kind of grabbing the land and getting it all for yeah. themselves. Yeah. And, and so like that, and so now they're building their community on that truth. And of course, uh, it's not a truth, or, or rather, there is a kind of falsehood, right, upon which my community is being built. And then the problem is that right. the truth I'm building in my community is going to be false, yeah. right? or, or yeah. it's going to be, yeah. Yeah. And, and perpetuate itself. And yeah. then I'm really in error as an individual, not in truth, right? Exactly. And so right. that's the- that's And the yeah, issue. we all have to understand what our role is. You know, already determined by these previous actions, right? Uh, which is challenging. Yeah. Well, I um, I was really I, I find Jane Adams' stuff fascinating. Yeah. And the one, one thing that I really love about it is that she's not thinking about community abstractly. Mm -hmm. It's these people right here. Yeah. You know, and so you know. Um, Realizing truth through building community, which requires work, which requires all sorts of uh, integrated mm -hmm. activities, and, and so on. Uh, whereas I, I was puzzled ab about uh, Hearst's thinking about mm -hmm. community because so we didn't look at that much uh, in his writings, mm -hmm. but it, it seemed very abstract that it's mm -hmm. sort of um, you know, a bare entailment mm -hmm. of understanding how logic operates. So I'm wondering if there's something in purse that gestures more toward, you know, the uh, the vibrant <clears throat> and this year's mm -hmm. sense of community that yeah. you have in yeah. 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, to, to flesh that part out, I have a kind of, there's one paragraph where I have a whole bunch of stuff crammed in. <clears throat> so the, the logic of inquiry, the science, the, um, the 1878 lectures on the logic of science um, talks a lot about how what we know is dependent on how we kind of fit into the community of inquiry. Uh, so that'd be one aspect of it that I have to stress out a little bit more. Um, but a lot of this really turns uh, I mentioned his experience in 1892. He had this religious experience at a church in New York. Um, he feels the call of the master to go to a communion, which is just crazy, rehearse. Um, and after that, his, his, his writing and thinking really take an interesting turn. And so the, the, that's where the logic of relations really begins to emerge and purse as the, as the engine of his whole, of his whole logic. Um, and that's where we get, you know, evolutionary love. Um, um, we get um, the law of mind. Now, all these real speculative essays that that are, are crazy when you read them. Uh, and I think he's trying to work these things out. And it's so hard to bring down practically for first. I think that's where he's really struggling to do. Uh, so I think when he when he begins to realize that he he's dependent on this kind of figure of the community for the logic, which is his life project, and he can't put his hands on it. That's when he goes back to church. Um, and it, it just, it just, I mean, it's, it's so crazy. I, there's a, a very interesting essay um, by a guy named John Anderson, <clears throat> the purse in this church in Milford, where he was taking daily communion. And my Percy and friends say, there's no way first could do that like I agree he's a crazy guy but taking daily communion talking to the rector of the church he argued his way onto the church role even though he was divorced the guy put him on the church role which was which was against the practice um he applied for a job at a at an episcopal seminary right which is just really strange when you think about first training training pastors um so I think that was at least uh for him one of one of the ways he saw that this could lead him was in some concrete community. So, yeah. Well, wow, you've asked some really hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so, well, so you much. What you started with, um, like Christian nationalism, right? Yeah. Like that. Um, I think we can talk about the community of robbers. And Absolutely. Like, like so, uh, the threat. Right, like immigrants and whatnot. Um, yeah. So there's the stronger sense of community formed by this, like, uh, this negation, right, of what's non American and what's American. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm thinking about like your question about like American philosophy, like what American philosophy can do or how, how do we fix it? Yeah. And thinking about what is American <clears throat> identity. Right. Um, right. Right. And so, um, and we, we talked a bit about like what was here before America, right? <laughs> so we, right, like when, how do we understand American philosophy in those terms? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When there was the community before this country, yeah. before this nation that, that <clears throat> it yeah. destroyed. Yeah. Uh, but also, um, I mean, we should talk about communism, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, so I, I was thinking a community that's not based on like, identity, uh, ex like exclusionary identity, mm -hmm. but communal practices, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. understanding community in different terms and how uh, American identity is so close to, uh, closely related to this negation of communism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. It seems like the idea of community that Adams is talking about is closer to what David Graeber talks yeah, about, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. right? Everyday communism, yeah. like how communist um, principles are already embedded in our everyday lives, right? right? Like right. so, when I yeah. give you something, I don't 
right. expect something in return from you and we're friendly terms, right? right. So, so maybe <coughs> understanding co community and communal practice in, in different terms in relation to what is democracy and what yeah. is American yeah. identity. Yeah. So uh, two points, because I, I, I agree completely. So um, uh, Scott Pratt, who's at Oregon, mm -hmm. has done a lot of work on indigenous uh, thinking mm -hmm. and showing that a lot of the deliberative democratic practices are actually drawn from early interaction with indigenous mm -hmm. communities. So many of the, the shared decision-making uh, processes we take as democracy mm -hmm. actually have deeper roots. Yeah. So yeah, understanding that you were already drawing these ideas together is one way mm -hmm. to start that mm -hmm. we're, we're already blending some of these ideas. Um, John Dewey's wife his first wife her father was an indian agent uh in minnesota mm -hmm. and so dewey had a lot of interaction with indigenous communities from her and from her father that began to shape his idea of democracy so those ideas actually filtered into how he described mm -hmm. democracy in a lot of his his works also so i think there are some lines there that yeah. things can can connect to um, yeah, David Graeber is very interesting. A lot of the everyday mm -hmm. communism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question. Well, I say let's thank our speaker and then we can uh, have a community <laughs> also. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate the opportunity because I'm